think that's hopefully working. Um, great. Right. OK, without any further ado, then, um, Mary, are you happy if I hand over to you? I am indeed. I'll just share my screen and let's hope this works. Um, if you could tell me when you see it, I know things take a bit of time, don't they? That's coming up now. That's that's great. We've got that now. OK, that's wonderful. Um, I, I don't know my audience, so I'm presuming that some of you have been flooded, um, but also that some of you haven't. So I'm going to start off with um, with with really talking about just how awful it is to be flooded. Um, having been flooded myself on many occasions, um, the worst of all was actually 21 years ago this month. And obviously it had such a, a devastating impact on me that 21 years later, I am still campaigning about flood awareness, flood resilience, flood preparedness and the awful impact of flooding. And I, I really don't know, that, I don't think that unless you been through the experience that you can appreciate just how awful it is and I'm sure quite a few of you on, on this call today will have, will have been through the experience and and um, you know my heart goes out to you it really does but of course what people don't realize when they have been flooded is that the, the worst bit of being flooded is the recovery not the flood. I think we all, when we've been flooded, I know I, I stood in sort of in my Wellington boots with my neighbours drinking red, red wine and not realising quite what was waiting for me around the corner. And of course, these, these pictures that I'm sharing with you today have been given to me and shared with me by people that I've either supported or talked to and included and actually includes my own home um, in, in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, 17th of December 2000 that was the second flood when we'd already had all the plaster knocked off um, everything was removed and we were flooded again and so that's one thing I always say somebody had said to me oh well we've had a one in 50 year flood dear I'm 80 years old I'm not going to see another one and three weeks later we were all flooded again but worse so you know always be prepared, never say never. So really, having been flooded myself on many occasions and had to live through the awful horrors of recovery, I decided that I was going to make my own home flood resilient. So the year 2000 wasn't my only flood, it was my worst flood and I'd been flooded lots of times before that. So I did lots of looking into what I could do to make my home flood resilient. And when I was flooded again in 2007, it wasn't nearly as bad for two reasons. One, I'd lobbied for uh, a pumping station from Seven Trent Water and been very successful. And another thing I learned is that a flood alleviation scheme can reduce your impact. It will never take it away. And that's something I've been very passionate about since I was flooded again in 2007. Um, the, the generator was, um, the, the electricity went out, so the pump stopped working, the generator was overwhelmed, but luckily I had a, a household flood plan and I wasn't in, but my teenage boys, and I say teenage boys, um, found mum's flood plan and actually put it into, into action. So by the time I got home through all the flood water, all my belongings were upstairs, and all the, even the curtains were tied in knots and thrown over the over the curtain rails. And very surprisingly, they'd even taken the doors off and taken them upstairs. So when I was flooded, due to the, the resilient adaptation, I'd got waterproof plaster, uh, ceramic tiles on the floors. I was able to and I've got my plug sockets up the wall. So basic stuff in the year 2000. Um, that, that we, I was able to just sort of pump it out, sanitise it and carry on living there. And it was from that moment, the light bulb moment, that I spent the, the, the next N years researching what can be done at a property level to reduce the impact a flood can have. So there is no one fix for flooding. Flood risk management is a jigsaw of many pieces. 
So we've seen the flood alleviation schemes overtopped, compromised, overwhelmed in recent years. And we've got natural flood management, sustainable urban drainage, lots of things that can be put together to, be, to manage flood risk, but not stop it. And the bit that I always concentrate on is our homes and our businesses that are on the receiving end, end when everything is overwhelmed. So the re residual risk, as it's called. Now, one thing that I'm incredibly passionate about is banning the sandbag. This wonderful picture that you that um, I've got with a huge mountain of sandbags was actually sent to me by a community in in um, Somerset after after the floods there in 2014, and they hate them with a vengeance. And I was told the people that sent me this that those smelt like rotten fish. So. As an experiment a few weeks ago, I decided to, to put four sandbags in a British Standard Institute testing tank. I used four because that's roughly what we're given at a community level to stop the flood water. And I turned on the tank and in just 59 seconds, those sandbags were leaking through into the house. So then I thought, right, OK, let's build a bit of a barrier in front of the door, um, I used 10 sandbags and those sandbags, 10 sandbags, and you can see them in the top right hand side of the picture, they failed in two minutes, five seconds. So really that time could have been better spent instead of trying to source sandbags, better spent moving your car, moving your belongings. And I, you know, I, I can, can't overemphasize this fact to you that if you can spread the word that sandbags don't work and that you can be doing better things, even putting duct tape down the sides of your doors would be far better than using sandbags. And here's another couple and excellent examples of sandbags not working. Uh, the one with the guy walking on the big ones, that's York. So look, here's some examples of property flood resilience working and working well. You can see that everywhere inside is dry. And my favourite one is, as you can see, the sandbags uh, with, with the water gushing past and the sandbags having failed and the barrier working. And what we can't see in, see in the picture is a pair of red shoes, completely bone dry, uh, standing in front of the barrier. Now, flood barriers are just one part of the toolkit. They won't just just using a flood barrier won't keep your water out. So I have written a guide, uh, a homeowner's guide to property flood resilience, and you can see the, the graphic design at the top, which will which actually can point you to all the things that you can do to reduce the impact. So such things as self-closing air brakes. You can get air brake covers as well, but you know, the Environment Agency tend to send flood warnings at 3.30 in the morning. So you don't want to be fitting air brake covers in the rain on 19 air brakes at, at 3.30 in the morning. So self-closing air brakes are better, non-return valves, sumps and pumps, and making sure that your home um, is, is well maintained. Water will find its wicked way in anywhere. If so if you've got an outlet pipe, make sure that outlet pipe from your uh, from your washing uh, machine or your your um, washing up bowl is has got the sealant around it. Make sure that your mortar is in good condition. Just basic winter routine maintenance. So there's lots and lots of different things you can do to try and keep the water out. Now, this guide is on my website, along with lots of other information, marydono.com. And Dono is D-H-O-N-A-U. Actually, it's on my slides. I keep forgetting that. So what I want to concentrate on really today is I'm very aware, as I've said, that flood defences can be overtopped. So can property flood resilience products. They can be overwhelmed. And I've said earlier on that the worst bit about being flooded is the recovery. So I was very keen, having made my own hub flood resilient, to talk to real people who have been flooded and live at flood risk, talk to them about what they've done and find out their successes. 
and they're really inspirational, powerful stories. Now, this eMag as well is a free download um, on my website. So it's got about 40 case studies of homes and businesses in it. So do go to my website and have a read of it. But I'm going to tell you some of them today. And these are sort of some of my favourite ones, really. Now, this is Karen in Appleby. And um, oh, and I'll, I'll also tell you that th quite a lot of my case studies are being brought to life within the Oxcam Pathfinder project. The films are also on the bottom of my front page of my website. So short YouTube length films, which bring bring further bring the case studies in, in my um, EMAG to life. So Karen is a, an amazing woman. She lives um, right almost on the banks of the of uh, the river in Appleby and she's been flooded three times and you can see here the depth of water outside her home and she was flooded during Storm Desmond um, and the uh, when the River Eden reached unprecedented levels. Now Karen was out of her home for eight months and her insurance bill was £48,000 and Karen after her second flood thought enough's enough so these are some of the measures that she taken. Um, I'm not going to read them all out to you. You can read them. But some of the things that, that, stick, that stand out for me were the fact that she'd made a flood plan. She knew exactly what she was going to do in advance when she re received a flood alert and flood warning. So I know from experience when you get that, your heart goes into overdrive and your mind goes into whirring. Actually having something written down is so important that you know, oh, those plastic boxes are here and I've got to do this first and or oh, move my car. You don't want a flooded house and a flooded car. So having it written down really helps. Um, and also one thing that she did do was she she got different kind of furniture. A light, um, sort of either lightweight furniture that she could lift upstairs or um, solid wood furniture that can be flooded. What people don't realise is that solid wood furniture can recover, um, so your doors, solid wood doors can recover, mahogany can recover, oak can recover. Um, so just remember that we throw far too much away. Now, one bit of advice I did give to Karen, which she's going to implement is you can see the table there, actually standing that table in four old Wellington boots, something simple and cheap would save the table from being flooded as well. So, um, sorry, um, what I was going to say is after um, Karen had done all this, and one thing I must point out is that doesn't Karen's house look lovely? It doesn't have to look ugly. She's got waterproof plaster, ceramic tiles on the floor. You can get lots of ceramic tiles that look like real wood and even I can not see that they're ceramic tiles. So things can still look beautiful. But when she was flooded again in 2015, um, sorry, so this year, last year, 2020, Karen um, was able to, because of the simple measures she'd taken, Karen was able to return home within only 24 hours. Now she had to make, she just literally swept it out, sanitized it, came back home, and she made no insurance claim whatsoever. So what a big difference from being out of your home for eight months and a 48,000 pound insurance claim to be out of your home for only 24 hours and no insurance claim. And Karen is now a convert. Another one is um, Martin in Leeds. And you can see again how near he lives to the river. When I was with him, I'd made a film with him and he's become quite a good friend. Um, I asked him, would he go and live somewhere else? Have, bearing on mind his experience. And he said, he and his wife said, absolutely not they see deer swimming across the river they live so near to nature that they decided that adaptation is far better than moving house so as you can see um, on boxing day uh, the river air exceeded its previous recorded um, levels we keep hearing that unprecedented higher than last time this is climate change it's real it's only going to get worse and even the barriers they had in place were overtopped. 
And so Martin, sort of because he'd been flooded quite badly on quite a few occasions, he increased his flood barriers and he got self-closing air bricks. We've got to remember that things like self-closing air bricks do need some maintenance uh, because spiders get in there or if they've been compromised by the flood, you get all the grit in there. So to remember, they're not fit and forget. You do have to sort of take the fronts off and get all the detritus out. Um, and they would also fitted, and this is high end, but for somebody that's at regular risk of flooding and chooses to stay there, he fitted a, a, a membrane system where the water will come through the walls and go behind the membrane system and there's membrane on the floor and into a sump pump. And he also uh, was quite keen on the film to, to emphasise the fact that he's got battery backup to the sump pump just in case of power cut. So it's always planning about in advance what you're going to do um, if you do flood. He's also got, and I, I've shown this photo because this is plastic flooring. Now, it just looks like laminate flooring that we all like to use now, but it can be flooded. And also in the film, he told me that he had a burst water pipe and that plastic flooring was under underwater for 19 hours before he found it. And he was able to sweep it into the sump pump, no problem at all, um, and carried on being, being perfect. So I just thought, well, I'm going to check this myself. So I had found a bit of his plastic flooring um, he gave me, I didn't pull it up. And um, I, I soaked it in um, some horrible sort of composty type water for over a week, it, stinky water. And I got it out, run it under the tap, perfect condition. So now I'm quite converted that, uh, you know, this plastic laminate flooring is fit for, for the purpose that we need it for. And then as another one, this lovely couple um, have been badly flooded on three occasions and they're sort of quite elderly so I wanted to show people that are sort of slightly older and how they they deal with it they're such a lovely couple made me some fantastic homemade soup when I went to see them um, and you can see um, the devastation that they suffered so they 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 the solid wood kitchen which is something that I've mentioned before that solid wood does survive they've made that from an elm that was lying around in their farm a local craftsman had made it and they built robust um, walls to try and keep the water away with barrier they fitted flood barriers to the to the openings um, you know non-return valves everything they, they could do to keep it out putting their boiler on, on uh, up the wall and, the, and their freezer on plinths, everything they can do to keep things out of harm's way. And um, when they were, oh, sorry, I keep moving it on. Um, when, when they were flooded in again in 2020, I gave them a ring and they said, apart from the fact, you know, that flood, flood, flooding was happening at 3.30 in the morning and it was hard on them to have to get up to keep an eye that the measures were working, particularly their sump pumps that they got in the garden. They didn't get any water in at all. But on the occasions they have had water in that they, they were able to just to sweep it out from the front door to the back door and sanitize it and just carry on living there. So they're very even though they're in their 80s, they're really laid back about it because they've got a plan. They know exactly what they're going to do and they know that they can recover very quickly. Now, I thought I'd use a couple of businesses as well, just in case people from business are, are listening in, though I doubt it. I guess they're, they're at work. But do pass the, 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 the news on that these these shops that I'm going to show you in Hebden Bridge have at least five foot, six foot of water in. And this particular one is one of the bigger shops in the in the market town. And it was shut for um, 111 days after being flooded. Now, they had been flooded on so many occasions that they too decided enough was enough that this is some of the things they did. And it looks truly beautiful in that shop. They've got rain screen panels and they've stripped back the walls so, uh, and then sealed them. They've got flood doors. Um, they've used marine plywood and all the electrics have been raised up. Their, their computers, a bit like mine, I'm standing to present my computers on a desk that they can, uh, on a, it's a standing computer and they can ramp it up so that, and they, they can also keep things, they've got um, 
hope I've got a picture here. Yes, I have. You can see they keep all their stock on a mezzanine level up high. And those beautiful jewellery uh, display um, count, um, counters are actually made of powder coated acrylic steel. So they can be washed down and they can and they can be then used again. And also you can see they've got window braces to the door. So the in the past that the flood water has um, burst through the windows, but putting braces up, it, it has stopped that from happening. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that when they were flooded, they were able to open within only three days, having washed it out and sanitized and everything instead of 111 days, three days. And I can see Emma looking really shocked at that, but it's so positive. And here's another one. This is beautiful um, gallery and they've been flooded on many occasions. And you can see the very fact that the former chapel was built in 1777. So the, the owner, Alison, has said it must have seen quite a few floods. But Alison's uh, gallery was absolutely devastated after Storm Desmond. And, she, you know, she was shut for a very long time and lost an awful lot of money. So she did lots of things, which I absolutely love. That that pink um, dressing table that you can see floating there has been upcycled. Practically everything that was flooded because it was wood has been upcycled and it's truly beautiful. And that floor is a ceramic floor. It doesn't look like it, does it? It looks wonderful. So here's some of the things that she's done. Um, and you can see that um, she's um, the counter base, for instance, and new shelves are made from marine ply and coated with a sealant. And there's that, that dressing table that was floating. And non-return valves, barriers, and her sh high shelf has uh, become, she calls it, our save our stock shelf. And if you watch the film on my website, you will see um, her, her going up up the um, the ladder and putting everything. So the minute they they get the flood warning, they get their flood plan out, and all staff are trained in managing the emergency plan, and all their stock goes upstairs. And again, she was open within only three days of being flooded again in 2020. So again, she was this not a picnic because the flood water can't be stopped. It can be managed. And I'm glad Hebden Bridge is getting a flood alleviation scheme soon. But they do know that that will only manage the flood, not stop it. So um, you know, having their emergency plans and building back resilience, she was able to open um, within three days, as I've said. Another one that I haven't shown um, because she she um, she had, had done less, but um, so I hadn't got enough as enough to show you because of what she had done and very similar stuff. She was open within 24 hours, not three days, but 24 hours. And also her, the actions she took were preemptive. She took on the, the tenancy for the property, knew it was going to flood. So she decided to make it flood resilient. And again, it's truly beautiful. And when the BBC rocked up to interview her, they, they refused to talk to her because it looked like she hadn't been flooded and they wanted somebody that was devastated. So she still managed to get her roar in and say, I've made my property flood resilient. It's the only way to go with the increasing threat we face um, due to climate change. And I'm open for business this morning. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that has inspired you um, and thank you for listening. But look, those swans may look very beautiful, um, but not so beautiful when they're actually looking in your living room window. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's brilliant, really. Thank, thank you so much. You so it's, much. Um, it's really, really, really inspiring really to hear those stories. Um, uh, we'll we'll take questions in a moment. Um, I just wanted to flag up the um, the the, the um, property flood resilience guide, which Mary uh, mentioned. We have got copies of that, and I'm more than happy to send anybody um, copies of that in the post. So I'll pop my email address in the chat, and if anyone would like a copy, just email me, and uh, we'll get something out to you. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll, we'll open up the floor um, and we've got um, uh, Steve Malpass here as well. Steve, hi, um, who's 
also able to answer any any questions that anyone has on on uh, in this area. Um, so feel free to put something in the chat or just raise your hand uh, with the hand icon at the top, and um, we can we can uh, go round. Um, Christine. Thank you. Um, I'm a local parish councillor. Am I allowed to put your booklet on our website? Because I put Living on the Edge from the Environment Agency and I had to get permission. So am I allowed to do that? Oh, absolutely. You can put anything of mine from my website or any links on, on, uh, on your website. Um, share it as widely as you want. And I say that to everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, I'll jump in there with a question if it's all right. Um, I, I know a lot of the case studies um, are looking at people who own their own properties. Um, obviously, that's not necessarily the case with businesses, but um, but I'm wondering what advice you, uh, either Mary or Steve, what advice you would have for people who are renting, so tenants, whether there's anything they can, um, how they can advocate to their landlords, what they can do without you know having to put necessarily a huge amount of investment into the property. Steve, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. And um, I just want to pay tribute to Mary. Uh, fantastic as ever. Brilliant presentation. Um, <clears throat> the tenant situation, um, and we've come across this quite regularly when uh, we've been rolling out our uh, PFR programme um, across the whole of the Wessex, across Somerset, and that... Um, <clears throat> from the environment agency's point of view, we have to obviously get in touch with the homeowners if we're uh, you know, proposing to help. So um, first step, I would absolutely recommend that any tenant needs to discuss this with the homeowner. Homeowners' responsibility is to look after their tenants and their properties. So in the first instance, they've, they've, they've got to um, speak to the homeowner itself, uh, themselves. Um, in cases where we're helping, we um, try and liaise, of course, um, with the tenant to let them know what's going on, um, the time frames, et cetera. But we have to get permissions. Um, and for the homeowner, they could be, you know, living nearby or, or indeed uh, we've had one, uh, some that have been living in Hong Kong. Um, so, you, yes, we have to get whoever owns the property, we have to uh, to get their permissions. Um, and then, of course, uh, liaising locally when we know installation dates, et cetera, with the tenants. Um, but reminding both the homeowner and the tenants that um, it's not just about us coming along, fixing things pro and providing um, some products. There's a bit of training involved, so the tenants are aware. Are the tenants signed up to our flood warning system? Um, because they need some indication as to when flood boards or whatever the products um, installed uh, need to be uh, installed at you know, an appropriate time in advance of, uh, hopefully in advance of um, you know, the rivers rising. So. Quite a lot, but first um, bit of advice is, of course, they need to speak to the the, the, the homeowner or the person that owns uh, the properties. Um, and in some cases, that could be a housing association or the National Trust um, or indeed just a private um, private landlord. Yeah, so that, that's, that's my my advice. Also, from, from my point of view, obviously, um, if if money's short, which it often is, um, a lot of people live in flood poverty. Um, I have written on my website, again, under, I think it's under Insights or one of my blogs about how to, how to reduce the impact at a home level um, with, if, you, if you really haven't got the money to do it, to, to buy uh, flood 
resilience products. Um, you can actually buy, there are quite a few products out there that don't have to have fixtures and fittings that if you don't, that you wouldn't have to get permission from your landlord to use. So you can get, um, there are two or three on the market that you can literally put in place that you can use a ratchet and, and stretch them out. And then th th it's, then you're keeping the, the water out as best you can. Um, again, you know, things like family flood plans, emergency plans, knowing exactly what you're going to do to reduce the impact can be done by homeowners and tenants alike. A couple of things that I forgot to mention, which I look on as, as really positive news, is that um, not very long ago, Flood Re, which is the government backed insurer, announced that once it's got through Parliament, round about next March, that if you're unfortunate enough to be flooded again, that they're going to give you up to £10,000 on top of your insurance play, uh, claim to build back better. So that's really great. So if you're flooded, they will help you. For instance, if you wanted to use that £10,000 to get a flood resilient kitchen, and there are many on the market now, you can use it for that because the, the worst bit is watching things always thrown into the, the tip unnecessarily when you can wash them down and sanitize them and carry on using them so let's become more sustainable and you know they're, they're they are doing that and that's something i've been lobbying for for a long time i work very closely with floodery and i'm glad it's happening and another bit of information is that in the past um, it's a fairly new industry property flood protection or resilience and in the past, there have been quite a few sort of rogue traders that have come on the market. We've all heard of them that pop up when the government give you grants. They say they knock your door and say, you know, we can come and fit this. We, you know, it'll cost exactly five thousand pounds. So and then they go bust or they disappear. Now there's, um, there's a, something called the Code of Practice, which is on my website as well. And I, I did work on that. And it will tell the homeowner exactly what to what to expect of the process. So it's divided into six different steps. So of, of the, the initial survey, what to expect of your surveyor, what to expect of your installer. And then also there is a sign off. So the surveyor will come back and check everything's been done properly. And very importantly, the handover to the homeowner. So you know exactly how to install the measures and very extra importantly, how to maintain them. And I say that because I've recently been in a community working with them. Isn't that wonderful? I can use the word recently. And they'd had a flood at Christmas and said that their, their products had failed. And when I looked into it, the products had been installed early in 2000 and nobody had had any maintenance. They hadn't been stalled. Uh, they hadn't been stored correctly. Some some new homeowners said they found them in their shed and didn't know what they were. Somebody else had got them outside. Somebody else in their conservatory. A lot of them have rubber on them. Those that rubber will degrade. If you leave products outside, the mice will come along and feast on them. So they, they won't work. So it's really important, just like when a, a, an, an alleviation scheme is tested in anger, it needs money for maintenance because it will degrade. Property products will degrade as well. So always make sure they're fit for purpose and that you know how to fit them. So have a dry run every year. Very important. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, got one question in the chat from Dixie and then we'll come to you, Kev. Um, so is there any financial support for homeowners wanting to invest in making their properties more flood resilient? Well, first of all, I, I have mentioned that, the, sadly, after you've been flooded, um, I don't know whether, Steve, you can talk about any local initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we currently have a, um, uh, a project running um, and it covers the whole of Wessex, which includes uh, communities, um, you know, across the Somerset um, area as well. Um, and the project um, uh, currently we are trying to get around and help those that are most vulnerable. So those that do flood regularly um we this has been running for about uh four or five years now we've got uh, many years still to 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 go 
So hoping to get round and helping uh, lots and lots more uh, communities. Um, the project is set up so that we um, raise the awareness of flooding issues with the community and you know the individual homeowners. Um, homeowners, um, you know, do need to be aware of their flooding issues. They're um, get the you know we're hoping they're all all signed up to receiving our flood warnings. Um, and the, the project basically covers all the costs of doing the survey, um, um, uh, raising you know the, the flood awareness, um, the complete service of getting a contractor, getting the installations, um, uh, the training that is involved as necessary with the the products. Um, we come along and do a post installation flood risk report so that. Uh, what the surveyor uh, looked at and suggested it, you know, to start with, has actually been installed and in, in correctly. Um, and then six to twelve months later, um, we come back and do a little training exercise um, just to make sure that everybody hasn't forgotten where they've stored things and remember how to put it in. Uh, so that's kind of tw up, up to about twelve months after we've installed uh, the products and that is all covered the cost of all of that is covered by the environment agency's project project from uh, then onwards in the future the commitment um, and this is all about the partnership funding uh, arrangements that the government um, are encouraging us to use is that future maintenance um, and looking after them are then with the homeowner. So all the cost, of, you know, the big cost of purchase, uh, well, the survey, the purchase, installation, that's all covered by our project. Um, and that at the moment is for properties at very significant and significant flood risk. Because um, we've got to get around and look after all those that are most vulnerable. Maybe in the future we will be able to get round again um, and help those where flood risk isn't uh, as, as high. Um, for those, there's of course they can do their self-help and they can um, uh, get, get hold of some products uh, and we're always willing to advise and help. Um, but for the project, for the, for the current project, uh, covers all the costs of getting everything in in uh, installed. Um, is that uh, sufficient? Is that is that okay? Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you, Steve. I mean, I guess the big question is, um, what? How do you define significant risk? So yeah, I live, okay. I live um, near Kingston, St Mary, and we've got people who have been flooded at least once some years ago and have come close recently. So they're very nervous about flooding. But I can't yeah. say that they flood regularly and um, some of them would probably have the means to sort of invest themselves. But it's the kind of questions they'll be asking, really. So of course, it, yeah. is it kind of ob like so do they have to fill in a kind of criteria form with? Yes, questions? of course. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I if I basically if I very briefly summarize our investigations, for any communities, be it one single property or a community of 30 that are uh, affected, it, uh, we, we will try and get round and help those that are the most vulnerable at the moment. Now, we've got um, on, certainly on, on the main rivers, we've got um, lots of aids in terms of um, hydraulic river modelling, um, and all the information from our flood maps that we look at to try and identify those that are very significantly at risk. If properties are flooded, then uh, certainly recently, uh, in the last sort of 20 years, um, well, they're, they're straight on the top of the list. Um, and if they've flood, flooded regularly, um, then yeah, they're high priority for us. Um, for the Wessex area, and, I, and I'm guessing all across the country, um, the 
the areas that flood regularly we know about on main rivers. That's the agency's bread and butter work to try and identify those properties um, that flood regularly. We're providing them a flood warning service. Um, and um, I would like to mention the fact that property flood resilience is the last resort. We will try and help um, in terms of flood risk management, providing better options if it's viable and if it's possible. Mary spoke about flood alleviation schemes. Um, if money was no option, we would get round and try and provide everybody with flood alleviation schemes. But the government set us a, you know, a, a series of financial appraisal criteria that we have to work within. And in a lot of cases, if you've got one property, as an example, one property, isolated property, um, it would cost an absolute fortune for a very small benefit. And in those, in those situations, it's not viable. So then we look at uh, other alternatives. And if all of them are discounted, um, then rather than walking away, we can offer property flood resilience uh, as, uh, you know, the last resort. So it's... Um, we're always trying to do, you know, give anybody the best that we possibly can. And then property flood resilience, um, it's, n as Mary's mentioned, it's never going to stop everything, but um, the installation of the products and the measures, they all help. But the huge element of all of this is just people understanding their own flood risk, having an, um, an individual flood plan for their property, joining in with the community, with the community flood plan. Mary was so lucky her boys were, were, were around on one occasion. But again, if, if, the, if the boys weren't there within the community, you've got to, they've got to help each other. So there's, there's a whole heap of things. And of course, it's, um, it's great to have all these products, um, but we need to try and uh, make sure everybody gets signed up um, so that they know when to get them fitted, when to install, especially if you've got lots of floodboards or lots of things that are required. Uh, more and more, as Mary's mentioned, we can have the um, the automatic um, uh, air bricks, no no flaps or covers to to add. Um, in some cases, we can have flood doors um, once they're closed. That's that's their that's their flood def defense uh, mechanisms. Um, issues with flood doors, of course, because they need lots of love and TLC. Um, so yeah, uh, does that does that uh, answer everything? Um, it does. Thank you, Steve. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. If I can just add a, a hint and tip there, while it's uh, on my mind, that. All, all the kite mark doors have been tested to a government standard, to BSI standards, so we know that they, they do work. But to get a tick that they have not, they can be allowed to leak up to one litre of water an hour. Some of them don't, but some of them do. Now, my advice always is to, if you've got a flood door or a flood barrier, to buy some of these absorbent cushions, a bit like Pampers nappies for giants, and put them on the inside of the door or the barrier so they can soak up any of the leakage. And also a really good bit of kit, costs about 50 pounds, is a puddle pump. And you can sit that on the floor and it, you attach a hose pipe to it, and it will it will keep the water down to two millimeters. So if you've got a, a sort of combination of the self-closing air bricks and your door uh, or a barrier, the, the absorbent cushions and a puddle sunk uh, sump, you'll be puddle sucker. You'll be able to keep it to a man a manageable level. Absolutely, I've actually seen those little puddle pumps um, tiled floors dry, Mary. Yeah, they're great. <coughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Kev, uh, would you like to come in with your question? 
Uh, yes, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, good morning, all. Morning, Mary. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation there this morning. Um, I'll just start off by echoing exactly what you said about sandbags. Um, <coughs> here, where we flood from generally rising water rather than flowing water, uh, absolutely useless. Um, they make more mess inside the house than they uh, uh, than they try and contribute. I, I dare say we're running. Uh, running water down streets, they may be more of a deflection or whatever. But a, a couple of things, if I may, um, I haven't had a chance yet to look at your website and, and all the material on there. Um, uh, but we flood regularly uh, or have flooded regularly. Um, uh, and we've taken as many resilient steps as, as we think we can achieve other than uh, what we keep replacing the kitchen with. Now, uh, we have over over the last 20 years, we've investigated various companies, um, some slightly dodgy, some more dodgy than others. Um, and uh, we haven't been brave enough yet to, to make a decision on what materials uh, we can uh, remodel our kitchen out of. Um, we, we, we do all the normal things. I mean, I'm in an upstairs room. You can probably see the washing machine behind me. Uh, freezers are lifted, and 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 I can I can cope with all of those things. But in our small kitchen, we have the base units which have to get replaced just about every every flood. Now, I'm still able to do that, so I can go and get them at B and Q or whatever I where I get them. Um, it's just a pain in the bum having to do it uh, every time. So I, I I would fancy something more resilient there. Um, uh, so if there's any more guidance on what materials, you said solid wood, whether there's anything else that can be used and, and sources of supply for that would be, uh, 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 you know, uh, acknowledged reputable sources of supply uh, would be uh, would be welcome. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, on the floodmobile, I've got a plastic kitchen which has got sort of normal Howden's doors on that, that can quickly be taken off. And the plastic carcass can easily be flooded, sanitised and washed down. And I've also got one um, that is a sustainable, um, it's a carbon um, neutral um, zero kitchen that's called Pucelli. It's more, I can, if you email me, I can give you the details. Um, I've, um, and uh, it, it can be, um, you know, the idea is if you've got your family plan, you move the lower drawers and take everything out, but it can be flooded and sanitised and washed down. And if anything is degraded, it will be the odd screw and they can easily be replaced. They do not have to be chucked away. Um, there's also a steel plan kitchens, which are based essentially steel and they've got uh, powder uh, uh, coated acrylic on the doors. The, that they look beautiful. And in fact, when I project managed uh, something for the DEFRA property round table up in Cumbria, we installed a steel plan kitchen for a community centre. And it was a lovely sort of green colour. And uh, again, can be flooded and sanitised and washed down. So uh, do, do get, drop me an email and I'll give you the links. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much Mary, for that. The second point, if I've got, if I'm allowed, Emma, uh, I'll just uh, plough in with the mention on flood re. Um, we haven't claimed for flood damage for uh, at least 18 years um, and uh, we uh, we only ever made two flood claims. Um, however, we still have trouble uh, getting value for our house insurance. Uh, and we've ended up even even with this flood re in the background. We uh, at my last renewal in December last year, I had a choice of four policies to take up, none of which wanted us to cover uh, any content flood damage. Um, so, do so, go to the flood re website, mm -hmm. and on there they will have a list of I think it's eighty eight insurance providers that should give you full cover including for your contents with um it's uh 250 pounds excess so do do visit and if you have any more problems drop me an email um right. because it should be readily available for you without any problem right no you see we we set off where we're sat here and i think our our excess starts at about five thousand pounds no it shouldn't um, it really shouldn't it's 250 really yeah Right. via Floodery. So do visit their website, floodery.co.uk.
Right, right. Thank you very much. And one more, if I, if I can, very, very quickly. The le there was a lady on here from uh, Kingston St Mary just now. Uh, she's disappeared from my screen, but hopefully still still on. Um, we locally here at Bathpool, we've been talking to FWAG quite a lot. Um, and, and we're looking at, uh, at going in for leaky dams and uh, wetlands and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, now, our contact at FWAG, I believe, has recently been in touch with uh, a representative from Kingston St Mary um, to try and look at plans to start slowing the flow for you of, of Kingston St Mary, uh, the Kingston stream, sorry, um, which water ultimately ends up where, where we are, um, uh, as well as slowing Maidenbrook, Allensbrook, Dyersbrook, Lingford streams, which all, all end up here. So so hopefully we, we can have a bit of a joined up a, a approach on solving or helping to solve the local, uh, you know, a local issue. Mm. Um, um, can, can, I, can, I just, can I just come in there? Um, yeah, thanks, Kev. I've been in touch with Millie Bowden and she's yeah, coming exactly. out on the 25th and we're walking the village. And I think, I mean, this is, this is just really helpful because it's a it's an all round approach. We need to look at what we can do to prevent the flooding. But yep. we for those people for whom it might still happen, we also need to look at their resilience. So, yeah, yeah. Um, that sounds like um, Kingston and um, where you are. We've got a few similar issues, really. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Well, we're, at, we're at Bathpool. Uh, she's also looking at Coombe as well, um, okay. just so you know. Um, which is being organised through uh, that 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 particular visit is being organised through uh, the clerk of our parish council. So um, yeah, so hopefully along the line we'll start seeing a bit more uh, improvement, shall we say? Yeah, Isn't absolutely. And I think community people? awareness is much higher as as yes. well. People are yeah. they're much more aware that flooding is going to happen, basically. Really. So there is an excellent charity called Slow the Flow. Do yep. have a look at them. They do loads of training courses and they're a wealth of information and they're sort of based in the Calder Valley. So do go to their website because you'll find out so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And that, that reminds me of your slide with all the jigsaw pieces, Mary, because it is uh, that, that's what we always say when it comes to flooding. It, it, you know, you need all of the different different pieces of the jigsaw yeah. puzzle. Um, I think we've hopefully got time for just one more question in the chat, um, and uh, that's all the questions we've got at the moment. Um, Mary, do you have any particular in experience of installing flood resilience measures in listed buildings and obtaining listed building consent? That's a question from Alison. Nightmare, isn't it? Yes. Um, really, you have to work very closely with, with the uh, listed buildings officer. There are a couple of flood doors out there now that have that are recognised by um, the, the list buildings um, officers that, that they will let them, they're called heritage doors. Uh, there's a couple of, of the bigger companies actually have those, but it, it, you have to be more patient. There are things out there. One of the air brick covers, for instance, can be used. Um, it's got um, hidden fixtures and fittings, so you can, you can um, easily fit that. Um, as the, and also there's a couple of the barriers that are recognised and allowed to be used. So really, it's, have, have a good look in my um, in my homeowner's guide to flood resilience, and and always open up the line of communication with the listed buildings officer before you even go down that route to find um, you know what what constraints they're going to put on you. And I always say when I get a bit cross when they get difficult because. You know, the choice is at the end of the day, you either save the house with some flood resilience or the house degrades and we lose the house. So we lose the historical benefit of the house. So do point Ab that out to them if it's difficult with Ab you. Absolutely, absolutely, Mary. I couldn't agree more. We've currently got, I think it's 25 applications for listed building permissions uh, currently lodged with various um, authorities from the new forest to the Mendips um, and, and various areas in between. Um, um, and on top of the complexities of the listed building applications, some officers are really, really difficult just to make the process just that little bit more harder. So yeah, absolutely agree, Mary. It's very frustrating. Yes, it is. 
thank you for that. Hopefully that's answered your question, Alison. Um, and hopefully we're all getting a little bit more forward thinking with these things. I live in a listed building and um, uh, it's it's been a huge frustration that they won't let us put double glazing in. But um, you'd think in the climate emergency that these things would be prioritised. But hopefully we're getting there with a bit of joined up thinking. Um, so I, I, we're nearly at half past 11. I don't know if anyone else has any super quick questions we've got time for. Um, there's one quick question that I wanted to ask. Well, I hope it's, it, it might not be that quick, but um, just uh, uh, we, we had flooding, obviously, that was very um, you know well publicized in 2013, 14 here in Somerset. And one of the aspects of that flooding was that it went on for a very long time. Um, so some of the properties were underwater um, for you know weeks and weeks. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you have any particular advice um, for, for homeowners who who um, you know though what would work better in that situation where it's not just the water's in and out very very quickly I mean we're hoping you know that there's a lot more resilience in the system now but um, but in cases where that flooding might go on um, what are the sort of particular things to think about there well obviously Mary, Mary do you want to start yeah well I, I, I again if I can refer you to my emag um, and ask you to look at, I think her name is, I've got so many, Sarah in Shropshire was underwater from the River Severn because that is a very slow rising river um, for two weeks in January this year, um, and sorry, 2020. And um, she, she said to me that without a series of pumps, the water would have got a lot deeper and she just kept her pumps going. And her, her story, again, is inspirational. She was able to, to, once the water had gone, because of the sort of waterproof plaster, the solid floors, the solid kitchen, the emergency plans, um, she was able to, to hose it out and sanitise it. Um, what, one, one hint, if your water's been in, in the property for a long time, we all know it's muddy and it's horrible. Again, one of my case studies in Shropshire that regularly gets flooded, he chucks um, a load of um, fairy liquid into the water and agitates it. And actually, he uses bleach. I'm not allowed to advocate that because, because but he does. Um, and he puts a couple of bottles of bleach and some fairy liquid and they agitate it. And as it's leaving, they have these big mops called squeegee mops, a bit like the things we clean showers and windows with. But they're huge size and they, they go out like that and the house is clean because of what they've done. So if you get flooded again, remember before it goes out to chuck some cleaning products down, up to you whether you use bleach. I'll just mention that he did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, the points I'd like to make regarding um, long durations is um, it is still manageable. Um, as Mary's mentioned, um, pumps are critical in in certain situations, just managing to keep levels down. Um, but uh, just w one word of, of caution, of course, is that with pumps, you need to be careful um, with some sort, some types of properties of uh, drying the ground, ground out too much. Um, there is, you know, some very old uh, cottages around where the footings rely on them staying wet so just be careful of not drying ground out too much but uh, yeah pumps pumps are very very uh, needed for uh, long durations just managing uh, to keep levels down that's wonderful thank so you everybody we've got a hand up actually I oh think. have we yes oh. me <laughs> And Apologies, I didn't see that. If um, you, you come on in, okay. Um, can you hear me? Or yes. Am I right. Um, our my I was listening in. We're in Coombe St Nicholas, where you know we had some bad flooding back on the 28th of June when we had a a real flash flood all the way through. Um, a lot of our residents are concerned, although they did get flooded, but getting the leet and the streams and all that sort of thing cleared although they're riparian rights will you be doing anything some sort of um uh, thing like this on 
how we can go about getting those type of things so that that will help people getting stop getting flooded <clears throat> yeah the um well the the, the environment we, agency we had Mary, a lot uh, of... sorry we had Helen smith and all her group came round um so but of course that takes time <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The Environment Agency have got um, uh, a workforce that do, do go out and do routine um, maintenance, um, especially this time of year before, uh, you know, the winter storms come in. Um, and that would be to um, in, in any in any areas where they deem, uh, you know, there's, there's flood risk potential to, uh, to, yeah, to remove vegetation and uh, fallen trees or, or something like that but you you are absolutely right the initial responsibility for yeah maintaining all the you know the water courses um are the repairing owners so certainly um yeah try and um speak yeah, speak to the locals a long, long stretch with say 20 different owners and getting if one does something and the other one doesn't then you know you're back to square one again sort of thing can I yep, suggest yep. Um, you do is get a oh, working group up? Because um, yep. if I can point out, there's a lovely uh, flood group in Boddenham in Herefordshire, and they've got the details of what they've done on the Boddenham Parish Council website. And the average age of the group there were over 70. And they all used to meet on a Friday night and clear out the ditches and the drains and then go to the pub afterwards. And they had quite a good community um, set up afterwards. And they also did fundraising for the equipment uh, with bring and buy sales and cake sales and all sorts of things. And the community there is wonderful. So do visit their website, the parish council website, and see what they've done. Yeah, we did think of trying to get some sort of community thing. But, um, yeah, it all takes time and effort. And it's yes. a long, quite a long stretch, uh, yes. you know, a mile. So it's... Uh, do have uh, a look, though. It'll, I'm okay. sure it'll inspire you. Boddenham. Boddenham, yes, in Herefordshire. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I would just add as well that um, I know that Helen Smith, who's the um, flood risk manager at Somerset County Council, her team are, are working on the Section 19 report from the flooding incident that happened at, at Coombe St Nicholas. So I know that they've been out to, to speak to the communities. But um, they, they, that, that report, which is um, it, it's an obligation of the local uh, flood authority when there's been a certain number of properties affected by flooding, that will identify um, some of the causes for the um, what happened and and um, some potentially some actions going forward as well. Um, we also have uh, at Somerset Prepared, we offer a, a small grant scheme um, of up to £5,000 for uh, local communities or community groups um, for equip any kind of equipment or training that helps people to be better prepared for emergencies. Um, so all the details for that are on the on the Somerset Prepared website. We, we just ask for a 20% match funding um, from usually from parish councils. Um, and um, the other thing just to mention is um, has gone completely out of my head. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Love it. yeah. laughs> um, but uh, yes, my, myself and my colleague Dawn James in our in the flood um, community engagement team at Somerset Rivers Authority, we can help um, if if there's a community that wants to start a community flood group, um, then we, we can certainly help with with anything to do with that. So so please do feel free to drop us a line. and We'll see how we can help. OK, thank you. Now, I didn't see your hand, Anne, so I don't know if anyone else has got a hand up that I can't see, but I, I, I can't see anyone else with any questions. Um, in which case we've we've gone slightly over our allotted time, but that's it's been a, a, a really, really fascinating session. Um, if anyone has any thoughts or, or anything after the session that they want to, to share or um, or ask, then please feel free to email me. Um, and I just wanted to say a huge thank you to, to Mary and Steve. It's been a really um, a real pleasure listening to your experiences. And um, thank you so much for making the time for us. It's my Thank pleasure. you very much indeed. Cheers. I do apologise for any any extraneous noise. The joys of working at home. I now have a scaffolding out just being built outside my window, and it didn't start until I started presenting. So apologies for that. <laughs> You've done marvellously. Never have known. Thank you, Thank you Mary.
Yeah, thank you all very much. And just um, remember, we've got lots more events happening over the next couple of weeks. So do check out the, the program if you haven't had a chance to do so on, on Somerset Prepared. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.